Delighted. I'm, I'm in uh, Sacramento, California, as a lot of you who are readers of Senior Housing Forum know, and uh, Mark's in what town in Minnesota? Uh, well, I'm at home today, so I'm in Ramsey, Minnesota, about 30 miles north of Minneapolis. Ah, terrific. Terrific. So, um, And with that, let's get started. I um, Let me start by some just doing a little bit of, uh, of housekeeping uh, here for the day. Um, the first thing is, is we'll go about 45 minutes. That'll give us some time for questions, although oftentimes I find when I say we'll go 45 minutes and questions, the questions come in during the... Uh, conversation and so feel free to drop your questions into the box uh, any and I'm going to talk about how to do that in a minute uh, we are recording this webinar and we will upload it to YouTube so we will send a link out to everybody who registered both those who are with us today and those who couldn't make it um, it is brought to you by uh, Elder Mark, and Mark is with Elder Mark, and uh, so there are, there are several ways to interact with this. The first is we have a few poll questions, and I'm actually going to um, pop up the first one now, um, and so we can get your, your thoughts on this while we're working. And we'd like to just sort of talk, have, we're going to talk, this is really all about how you maximize um, revenue in your communities. And so we just like to get a feel for where you are right now. Um, in addition, if you move your mouse down to the bottom of the Zoom screen, you'll actually see um, some options. The first one is a question and answer. So if you've got questions in there, um, drop those questions in there. If it's something we can answer online, I'll try to do that. Or in some cases, we'll uh, pop the question off to, to Mark and let him uh, respond to that. And occasionally, we'll get a question we can't answer or we'll run out of time and we'll save those and we'll figure out other ways to get that. We also have a chat box, so if you want to chat and make a comment that everybody can see, you can do that, or you can um, uh, chat with just me and Mark, or with just one or the other of us. So lots and lots of lots and lots of options there. Um, the last thing is, is you see our talking heads off, probably off to your right, and. Um, you can move, you can shrink us and you can move us around. Uh, so you just move, put us wherever you want to do and that makes life sort of uh, easy. And I think with that, we're going to end this first poll. Um, we've got kind of a good mix, about 15% say they're night capturing, I think, believe they're capturing 90% and above and that is just amazing, good job. Uh, another 20%, 70 to 80% and, um, 29% uh, at 50 to 70% and 7% of you or 33% of you below 50% of potential. So a lot of opportunity. Very excited, Mark, to have you present this. And with that, we are going to, um, we're going to kick off. Um, I am Steve Moran. I run Senior Housing Forum. Most of you probably know that and got to this webinar because of something that we posted or an email we sent. Mark, uh, Mark, Mark Anderson's with Elder Mark, and Mark, I'm going to have you talk a little bit about who you are and why you're an expert in this. Great. Well, thank you, Steve, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for your participation today. Uh, again, I'm Mark Anderson, Senior Vice President with Elder Mark Software. Been with Elder Mark now nearly seven years. Prior to that, about 25 years spent in various management roles within the senior living setting. And actually, uh, going way back, I was telling Steve, back to junior year of high school, starting as a nursing home orderly uh, back in those days, because that was one of the highest paying jobs you could get in a small town, is working at the nursing home. Not so sure that's still true. Yeah, I'm afraid that's probably not true. And of course, I was sharing with Mark that not working in a nursing home, but I, I cared for two different quadriplegics. I was in my, my teens and 20s. So with that, let's move on and start talking about how to get 42% or more margins. Sure. So we can move on to the introductory slide here. So Mark, why don't you start by just sort of talking to us about what the service model operational flowchart might look like? Sure, so this is really uh, starting with this today to kind of lay the foundation for the rest of our time together this afternoon. 
The service model operational flow chart starts at the top with your business model and then flows through the rest of the system. So we start with your business model. That's kind of your budget plan, maybe your pro forma, um, your mission, vision, values, you know, what you've set out to do, why you've set out to do it. And then from there, your service model is created to be consistent again with what you set out to achieve. Um, what does that look like? Are you gonna be independent living, assisted living, dementia services? Are you gonna be packaged, all inclusive? You know, are you gonna have a level of care model? How does it look like uh, when we translate, you know, your business goals into the service model, how you're going to provide care? And then from that, we put the service model into a workflow. So what are the processes that we will design to achieve that model? Um, and what are the process designs to serve the goals that we've set out? And then the fun part is the service model operation, putting everything to work in uh, meeting the needs of resident customers, putting your plan into action, you know, clinical management, financial management, all that stuff. And then while you are doing your good work, you're creating a lot of data, lots of information, however that's done. If it's within your electronic health record system, if it's in your other forms or, or flow charts that you keep, whatever system there is, there is information and data kept somewhere. And that takes us to operational analysis. And this is where I spend a lot of my work with our clients looking at the data and seeing what does the story tell us from that data? What is the feedback teaching that is available to us through the data we have? And then we take that data and we compare it to where we started back at our business model. And where things are in alignment, fantastic, let's keep doing those. Where things are not in alignment, that gives us the opportunity to make some changes operationally and then move forward and the cycle just keeps continuing over and over and over again but importantly it's that data feedback and a good day a good model i should say will give you that data feedback that data teaching that you need in order to answer that question how are we doing and then fill in the blank how are we doing in serving our customers in this area how are we doing in achieving our margin how are we doing in um, our assessment to service plan process? All these questions that we ask ourselves during the course of a normal workday, helpful answers there if we can create good uh, data that we can uh, analyze and take that feedback teaching and put it back into this operational flow chart. C continuous improvement, continuous quality improvement. Great. So we've actually got a poll question on that. Are we ready for that now? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So the, the question really is, is about how you actually figure out how you're doing and how you evaluate it. Do you, do you have dashboard reports or is it from reports you get from finance or exactly how you do that? So um, uh, a lot of people people have dashboard reports into financial, some Excel documents. Um, looks like pretty much everybody who's responding so far has at least something. And um, there may be many responses with the first three. Yep. Yeah. 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 All checked. Uh, first three all checked, and I think it's sort of good news that it's not the last two. So um, uh, we'll um, we'll end the polling now. And um, great, that's to that's real helpful because then that helps us through the rest of our discussion and time together this afternoon. That we can that we can assume that our participants have some sources of of data to, yep. um, to help them through this whole process. So that's great. Yeah. And it's really interesting because I think there was a time not that long ago where people, except for maybe having financials, uh, really didn't have very much. So let's talk a little bit about the assessment. Um, it's really the core, core tool or core thing that you need to do. So walk us through the assessment process and what that means. Right. So I like to start with talking about the assessment and its influence, because if you think about, you know, the, the normal flow of stuff in senior living, 
everything starts with that assessment. That clinical assessment is kind of our first real dig into getting to know our resident customer, um, determining what it is that they need from us and what we need to do then in response to the outcome from that assessment in achieving that resident's goals or helping meet their needs, however those have been assessed. And because of what that assessment tool is capable of, it influences the rest of our operations. It truly is the engine that drives everything else. And so when we think about the design of the assessment tool, we really need to think carefully about how that tool influences the rest of our systems and ultimately how it helps us achieve our financial goals. It is the assessment tool that after all drives what goes on that plan of, excuse me, the plan of care, the service plan. And from that service plan, that's what drives what gets recorded in the record, provided services, um, scheduled and unscheduled, other things that we do for the resident that ultimately find their way on the invoice, depending on how your service model is designed. And so what goes on that invoice then, of course, helps determine our potential for achieving or reaching our financial goals. So when we think about this influence of this assessment tool, you know, we can't put clinical operations in a silo or in a box and set it off to the side without understanding how that influences the rest of the systems and how it works in concert with our financial goals. And so when we look at the assessment tool, and when I work with clients um, in assessment development, we look importantly and how can we link that assessment to our true service model? And how can we link that assessment to our financial goals with how it's linked to our service model? That gets into uh, conversations about what is the assessment outcome? Isn't it more than just determining needs in ADLs? Is there a scoring system that relates to your service model? Do you have levels of care? Do you use points? What is it that you use in your system to get that assessment outcome beyond just determining some type of plan of care? Because it is that assessment tool that influences the rest of your operations. Each of these boxes in this diagram are their own system. But these systems don't act and, and exist independently from the others. They work together in the background all the time to influence all the other systems. Similar to the first diagram we looked at in the service model operational flowchart, those are each systems as well. And like that, the strength or the weakness in any one of these systems can influence the strength or the weakness in all the others because of how they are interconnected and how they work together in the background uh, to help you achieve your goals, whether it be the financial goals or your care management goals, um, customer service goals, all those kinds of things. Terrific, so we actually have a poll, one more poll question here. And the question is relative to, um, to assessments in terms of how you actually do uh, assessments, whether it's points or time value. So we'd love to um, hear back from you what, how you're currently doing your assessments. While they're doing this, Steve, let me just quick share a story, if I may, about scoring an assessment and um, particularly things like points. Um, about four years ago when I was really starting to get into service model design work with clients, I was talking with the CFO of one of our clients and they were struggling with their service model design and, and what to do with points. And so I just said, well, what is, what is a point for you? What does, what does it mean? And he said, a point is $15. I said, all right, that's helpful. Well, then where did you get the $15? And he said, well, that's one point. I said, okay, I understand, but where did that come from? And his response was, well, that's what the competition charges. Ah, so then I asked, is that point value directly linked or related to your financial model? And he long paused there and he said, I don't think it really is. I said, wouldn't you like it to be? And he said, yeah. 
So this story is a segue into our next uh, into our next section. So let's see what the poll results show, Steve. Uh, okay, let me go back up. I I clobbered it already, but let me put the polls up there. There you go. So most people have are using points, a few using time value, a few using dollars, and we've got um, uh, a combination, and a few are not using any scoring assessments at all. Um, sure. I actually going to have a question about that for you for later, Mark, um, because you know the the thought. We, I don't not necessarily want you to ask it right now, but to me, one of the things I find myself wondering is, wouldn't it be just a lot easier if you just did an all inclusive rate and then didn't have to worry about all this stuff? So don't answer it now, but I would I want to get to that later. So we're gonna yeah, see. let's let's because I have lots to say about that. <laughs> Good. Okay. Let's. I'm not, but I got it written down, so we'll get to it. Let's take a look where we're at okay so the third point we're going to introduce this afternoon is is knowing and understanding what it really costs you to provide care and so some symbolism here on the screen we're going to look at first you know in in determining the true cost of care what is that and a lot of clients i work with they really aren't sure or they go from a pro forma or some kind of budget plan that where there were estimations done or uh, you know information borrowed from some other model. And so when we're looking at the true cost of care, it's really important to understand, you know, what does it cost us to provide say one hour of care, one minute of care? Um, that is our biggest expense in our operations. We should really understand um, from a labor perspective, what does it cost us? So in the first hand, we look at wages. What are, what are we paying in wages? And then secondly there, um, what's the percentage add-on for benefits? What does it cost us to provide benefits to that position, say to that caregiver position? And then what are the, what are the payroll and related taxes that we also are responsible for uh, related to uh, scheduling that caregiver every hour they're on duty? And then finally, we add on um, overhead. And overhead seems to be a real challenge for many clients I work with, and that is they're not quite sure what to include there. What does that mean? Well, it can mean a lot of things. It can be depending on how you've, you've structured your business model. Do you allocate uh, some expenses for minor equipment or other operational expenses, training time? Um, you know, what is it that you include in overhead and allocate to that, that department or that position? Because whatever that is, that does add to what it costs you to have that person on duty for an hour to provide care and services, revenue producing care and services to your resident customers. Important to go through the, under, the, the, uh, the exercise to understand what is that true cost of care? And then when we look at what the true cost of care is and we, we figure that out, that gives us a good foundation then to determine, well, then what will the market tolerate in our pricing model? Well, we maybe have a margin goal or a markup goal in our um, financial model. Let's add that on top of what we've determined our true cost of care to be. And now we understand at an hourly rate, say, what we need to charge for care and services provided to residents in order to fully achieve our financial goals. And this is often a fun exercise to do with clients because more often than not, when we actually look at the real numbers, most people that I work with discover happily that there is additional room for a higher margin goal. Um, when they look at their market comparability studies, when they look at what the competition is charging, um, you know, there might, there is mostly a, a window there for some additional margin or additional markup um, to, to include in their business model in determining that true cost of care. So Mark, I, I actually have a question about this. So let's say that I'm an operator and I go through this process, right? And we're going to kind of go back to the story that you were talking about. And I discover that um, my true cost of care is $25 a point rather than $15 a point, except that everybody else in the marketplace who's doing points 
is also only charging fifteen dollars a, a a point. And so, how do I figure that out so I don't just end up price? I mean, I'd like to charge uh, I'd like to charge Eldermark um, uh, two hundred thousand dollars a year to be a sponsor too, except that you wouldn't pay that, and nobody else would. And so, I've got to think about where it is in the marketplace. So, how do I how do I figure how do I balance that? Yeah, so what, what this exercise helps us do when I work with a client I, I, through this is it, it, gives us, it gives us an understanding that needs to be placed within the context of the rest of the picture. And so when we look at the true cost of care configuration outcome, and let's say we get 20 bucks, $25 an hour, I think was your, was your uh, example. That's our true cost of care. Well, then we add on our margin and now we need to be charging, say, $34 an hour in order to achieve our financial goals. But the marketplace is charging less than that. Well, now we are at least informed about what our true cost of care is. And we're also informed how our margin stacks up against everybody else. Well, now we need to make some decisions. What can we do about this? Are we going to go to market with this? Are we going to make some adjustments on the rent side so that we can bring this down uh, and be more competitive? What the exercise does is it gets us to a point of just understanding where we are with the true cost of care. And then when we look at that number and we look at the rest of our operations, we can make some business decisions about where we even things out so we can remain competitive and still achieve or at least get close to achieving our financial goals. So then it kind of becomes a numbers game after we get through this process. So this, this, this determination doesn't stand on its own. It needs to be considered within the, you know, the whole realm of all the other charges that you are throwing at your customers to balance things out so that you can have a model that gets you as close as possible to achieving your financial goals, but also keeps you competitive in your market. Um, that can be a real challenge. Um, I'll give you a somewhat a related example, working with a couple clients um, now this year and uh, opening new buildings and they have, uh, their, their rents are so high, they haven't left enough room for what it really costs them to provide care and services. One particular example, a uh, client, they've only left themselves uh, $1,300 a month uh, to be competitive in the market for their services to put on top of their rent. Well, you think about that. Think about a dementia services setting and you know what a provider truly needs to charge for those services in a dementia care setting you put that dollar value on top of the rent for this client and they are so high priced out of the market, they can't go to market with those rates. Well, now they've got some work to do. They need to go back and figure out where can we adjust stuff to stay competitive and still achieve as much of our margin as possible. It'll be a real game. That's their job. Fortunately, I don't have to be a part of that other than help where I can, but well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually I'll offer one more additional thought observation on that, Mark, and that is that I think that um, it's possible to be that, you know, there's sort of a tendency to think that when I'm just looking at my service charges or my rent, I want to be middle market or maybe high end of middle or maybe low end of high, but I would also like to propose in a lot of cases, you can create a, a culture and an environment where you can be kind of proud to be the most expensive in town because people are getting, are getting great value because being the most expensive in town can be, can be the, the best bargain out there, right? So that would be just another approach to look at it. So For sure, it can be. But at least you're going into that, that strategy with a clearer understanding of where, where you tru do, truly do stand with your cost of care. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. You got, this is sort of my favorite slide, the next one. Talk to me about copycats. Yeah, so I, I love this illustration because when we talk about um, going to market with a model, typically what we discover is that many 
it used to be most, I guess now I might say many providers go to market with a copycat attitude. And that is, you know, and having been on the provider side, I, and we were guilty of this at some point I remember, and that is, I'm me, I'm going to market with a model and, uh, I don't want to be uh, too high. I don't want to be too low. So I'm going to go down the street and see what all my competition is doing. And then I'm just going to copy their models and make those models my models and go to market with that without doing the homework of determining what does it really cost me to provide care? What are my financial goals? How did I build that into my service model? And so I love this, art this cartoon, this, this illustration, because it really does it really does depict what is a very common practice in senior living. Well, and, and I would add to that, Mark, that it, again, what I see is I think that it often represents the problem of senior living in the marketplace, not just for the service model, but that there tends to be sort of a copycat in terms of how the program and, and how everything in senior living operates. And you know, one of the great opportunities I think we have is to be, um, I don't, this may be too irreverent, but I think that being the weird cat in the marketplace can actually have some huge benefits and to say, you know, we're not, we're not everybody's cat. We're, we're a Persian cat or I don't know, a hairless cat or something. And so yeah. we're tracking a certain slice of the market that we're particularly, but we're really, really good at that marketplace, which again, yep. sort of may, maybe puts you in a position to have higher than average market rates. So, yes. Well, in relating to this, we have a, a case study to um, to offer to our participants this afternoon. Okay, talk to us about the, the case study. So just a, a real quick illustration of this point and a case study on a, on a, on a copycat outcome. Uh, and this is a client I worked with a couple years ago, um, opening a brand new senior living community um, they didn't do much homework. They didn't want to stand out much. So they adopted a model directly from their competition and adopted the pricing from the competition, developed their collateral materials, um, went to market with their new community that was soon to open, got reservations, started moving in residents, and then they asked for an operational study on the model performance. So uh, working with their chief clinical officer, we dug into the numbers. And if we could just do one tap, Steve, to show in the results, this is the model that this particular provider went to market with. And so we see that they, they were able to determine a certain level of care through their assessment process. And then based on that outcome, a resident was placed within one of these uh, levels of care within their service model. And these were the rates that they were charging their residents. Well, when we went through the, the homework of determining the true cost of care and adding on their market margin and stuff, um, the results of our, of our operational study, um, if Steve, we give it one more tap, were these numbers. And we could see at the very beginning, the catered care, they were pretty close. But once we got into higher levels of care, uh, the variance was extraordinary. And as I was preparing this for today, I mentioned to Steve with these numbers, you know, the numbers there in red, those were just the numbers they needed to break even. Um, that is before we even added on their markup or margin goals. So looking so, in particular at the, or specifically at both the elite and the memory care elite models, what, what this is really showing, if I got this right, is they were losing uh, $1,000 a month per resident. Is that right? Yes, their model was uh, devastatingly wrong and uh, needed to quickly make some changes um, or, or they, were, they were never going to come close to achieving their financial goals. Okay, so, so this is, how do, where do I go with this? So this is really, um, this is kind of scary to me and so if I do this assessment and I, and I get this and I go, oh man, I'm killing myself, what do I do? You need to look at the reality and think about how can I make the change I need to make to stay open for one thing. Um, if this were me, I would need to just make some business decisions. If a consultant came to me and said, look, here's the numbers, here's, here's the outcome, um, let's talk about a plan. 
you know, you maybe you pick a date to start implementing a new model. Anybody moving in after that date go, comes in under the new model. You need to maybe make an adjustment internally for current residents. With normal resident churn, you know, you're not going to devastatingly affect too many residents over time. You know, the one fortunate thing for this particular provider was they asked for the operational study during fill up. So the building wasn't full, but still, <laughs> uh, they'd been open several months and, um, and had to make some corrections. So, and so did, did when they made those corrections, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying sort of euphemistically in corrections, it sounds like what you're really saying is they increase rates for uh, their care packages. Uh, did that impact their uh, sales process at all? Do you have a sense for that? Um, I do not. My, my scope of work, Steve, was to do the study and help them get the new model together. And then after that, they were on their own. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Perfect. So I think we've got one more poll question we're going to ask here. And so I will bring that up. Um, and we are going to launch that one right now. So if uh, a prospect or resident asks how you determine your fees and services, how easy is it for you and your team to provide a clear response? Oh, look at that. That's terrific. So most people say very easy, a couple not so easy, mostly very easy or somewhat easy. That's um, great. That's pretty encouraging. That is encouraging. Yeah, I like that a lot. So, um, yeah. And so we will give it just one more minute here and then I'll end the polling and show the results. Looks like, nope, one more, two more, nope. Okay, let's pop, nope, there's no why, there we go, almost there. So, um, We'll pop those results up for people to see. And so most for most of you, it's very easy. And for almost all the rest of you, it's somewhat easy. So that's, uh, that's, that's good. That's good. Yeah, good results. That's great. So we're going to close that down and we will. Well, and now, now we've seen a devastating case study outcome. Now let's look to... Um, a, a, the reverse, and this is a case study of a provider who did the homework. Um, this was with a brand new senior living community that was focused on dementia services. Um, they adopted a strong comprehensive tool. We linked their scoring of their assessment to their service model. Uh, they used the level of care service model there. We built that model with real numbers from their business model, operational expenses and margin goals, kind of the process we've been going over this afternoon. And uh, then we tested the model to be sure it had integrity and that it was gonna work. And so it, you can uh, give us a tap, please, Steve, and we can see the results of this particular case study of someone who did the homework. And this is a community that um, opened its doors uh, with immediate success, they became profitable by month seven. And um, after about 11 months, the decision was made by their board of directors to uh, duplicate this model to the rest of their senior living settings. Again, the, the homework paid off. Can you, uh, and what kind of margins were they able to achieve on their uh, service packages? So this was a um, good question. Uh, th this was a, a nonprofit uh, uh, organization whose board of directors would uh, go no higher than a 20% margin, even though uh, my study indicated that they could go higher. That was the board of directors' decision. And so um, this particular model um, was built around a 20% margin. So do you have a sense for what a reasonable margin is? Um, and actually a couple of questions. So what's a reasonable margin in most markets and what's the highest you've ever seen? Um, oh, good, good question, final one. Um, so the margin range I'd see anywhere from 15 or 20% up to the, the mid to high 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, 
common, a common margin goal when I work with service model design with clients is in the low 30s. Okay. And as you move people into this area, to these areas, do you find that it, um, uh, it, I guess, the, do you get pushback from the sales and marketing people as you do this? Well, I don't have to work directly with sales and marketing people other than sometimes uh, someone at a leadership position in that area may become involved later on when we start testing the service model um, to see, to, you know, just to test its validity. Because we work with models that, that will be um, competitive in their markets um, most of the time, uh, the pushback from sales and marketing is really only maybe for any change in the model. Um, generally, our outcome is that we have a model that is easier to articulate to customers and easier for customers to understand. Okay. And, um, and a model that is competitive in the market. Okay. So, uh, do, do, do. So talk to me about the relationship with caregivers. I, I, I actually probably like this even better than um, uh, the, the, the cat, I <laughs> confess, because this is near and dear to my heart. Yeah. So I included this because, um, you know, when we think about our discussion so far, um, you know, we've introduced the influence of the assessment driving everything else. But at the end of the day, it really is the caregivers um, and their work in providing the care, documenting the care, um, that that helps us get to where we want to go in achieving those goals, and um, and 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 reaching what we want to achieve. Um, as a as an operator, I often refer to my care teams as my business partners because that's exactly what they were, and I enjoyed sharing uh, you know certain uh, financial information with these teams. Because they, you know, the company, the organization was so dependent on their work performance uh, to get where we wanted to go, both um, in clinical goals, operational goals, and of course, financial goals. A um, couple of examples, I'll go in, back to my skilled nursing management days. Um, one example, uh, our workers' comp insurance premiums were getting out of hand. Our experience rating was getting too high. And so I sat down with our care teams and I showed them our premiums. I showed them the history of our rates going up and we had discussions about what could we do with the money we're spending on premiums that we could be doing something else if we weren't spending this high amount uh, on our workers' comp insurance premiums. And we put together a plan, partnered with the workforce to bring uh, our experience rating down through some additional training, we implemented a, a pre-employment flexibility screening to be sure that new caregivers had the physical flexibility uh, needed to perform their work because we were both, uh, we, we were pretty high level uh, TCU skilled care at that time, um, more so than, than, than a lot of the market. Um, we purchased electronic uh, mechanical lifts, you know, back in those days, um, electric lifts were not as common as they are now. The old hand pump lifts were, were more common. We did a few other things, and in partnering with those teams and these new workflows and, and policies and practices and what we did, um, we achieved our five-year plan in three years to bring that cost down for our insurance premiums because we so effectively influenced our experience rating. We did the similar thing with health insurance premiums. Um, our insurance premium rates were high because of our claims. And so we partnered with the caregivers and, and the rest of the team did education, helped them understand things about healthier lifestyle, did some training on using the nurse helpline, did some training on the availability of the employee assistance program, did some other things to help partner our, our team members to help each other in different ways, and that's a longer story than we have time for. But, and again, the end story there is within three years, we were able to affect our claims uh, history so much that we were able to bring down the cost of insurance premiums, which definitely helped our bottom line. 
So when we treat our caregivers givers as business partners or our whole workforce as business partners, they can help us not only influence our, our revenue potential as we've been going through the models today, they can also greatly help us, as I'm sure most of the participants uh, know that are with us today, help us control those expenses in ways that maybe we didn't think were possible before. So Sher Sherry Steele posted, and you can all see this, but I just want to really reiterate this because I think this is so true, is that when you talk to sales teams about the levels of care costs and explain that those are the costs that ultimately uh, are used to fund uh, the cost of staff, it becomes pretty easy for them to get on board uh, with the, the need for those and the importance of being able to describe them properly. So um, yeah. that that's great, great, great wisdom for sure. So for sure. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, uh, for sure. So um, and then uh, the, let's talk a little bit about uh, documentation. Right. So kind of rounding things out. Um, need to be documenting the good work that we do. Documenting everything, both scheduled and unscheduled, for the record, if your model is, uh, your, your financial goals are influenced, again, by what goes on the invoice, and that's influenced by um, the, the number or level of services you're providing to your customers, then it is essential to be able to document everything we do. And of course, this goes back to that old story about service creep. You don't hear the word service creep so much anymore, but it's still a thing. And where we see um, one of the easiest opportunities for revenue enhancement with our clients is in the capturing of those services that are not scheduled, but yet needed on a consistent daily basis with the resident customers served. You know, somebody is always needing an extra escort or some continence care service or something. And if we aren't documenting all those things that we do, we're missing out on getting paid for those, importantly, as is our topic today. But additionally, we're missing out on important clinical data that's required to best understand the total needs of our resident customers and to be able to gauge and measure the level of acuity of the population we serve within our communities. And certainly the, the clinical data is important, but for, for today's discussion, um, the amount of, of money being left on the table is enormous. And I'll give a quick example of a client um, where they were reluctant to implement um, a, a technology feature that would have allowed them to better capture unscheduled services. And so we offered to just let them use that feature um, for free for a business quarter. And they did that. And we, we did a data uh, study on the business quarter before that technology feature was introduced and a data study in the business quarter after that technology feature was introduced. And our finding was that once we introduced an easier means for documenting unscheduled care and services, that biz in that business quarter, this 120 unit assisted living memory care building captured an additional 3,300 service visits. Wow. With the, with the two, to the tune of about $26,000 in additional service revenue for that quarter. Um, the case was made of two things, certainly using the feature that helped that be easier, but also it fully illustrated the amount of money being left on the table every day, every week, every month, every quarter of services not being documented that your, their teams were providing in that community, services being given away for free. Um, Perfect. That, an easy story to tell because that is just, that is a common story yep. uh, everywhere. Cool. So I have, I've got a few questions for you. So one of the questions I have is, it would seem like an easy way to solve all this documentation and trying to know what to do is to just have an all-inclusive rate and be done with it. Um, sort of related to that, one of the things as I talk to people who are consumers and who interact with senior living consumers, 
one of the thing, one of the complaints I hear a lot of the family members in particular have is they feel like the that 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 it that getting their monthly bill is kind of a scary adventure because and they end up feeling kind of nickel and dimed on these things. So yeah. any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, that could be a whole nother webinar session, Steve. But a couple yep. comments. Um, the all-inclusive rate um, is a common is is not as common as it used to be, but still out there and certainly particularly common in the dementia services setting. Um, uh, a recent example of a client that we did an analysis with on their all-inclusive study that I think really illustrates one of the problems with all-inclusive, particularly in assisted living setting, and that is pretty much always the lower care residents are subsidizing the higher care residents. Because when you do that true cost of care analysis within an all-inclusive model, and you look at what residents really should be paying across that spectrum from low care to high care, you will quickly discover how much more your lower care residents are paying for one hour of care than your higher care residents. And a somewhat extreme example, but a real life example, a client I did a study with last year, their entire operation was all inclusive. And so we did an analysis and here's what we discovered. Their highest care, higher care, not highest, but higher care resident groups were paying on average about $13 to $16 per hour for their care. Now, anybody participating today will automatically react with, that doesn't even cover my cost of care. Their lower, their lower care residents were paying on average, get this, $60 to $65 an hour. Wow. For their care. Wow. Um, the variance between those two ends of the spectrum was tremendous. Wow. And, you know, one of the comments that came out in our discussion was, how long will it be before your customers figure this out? Um, that is incredible. Yeah. And so, so I, yeah. That's, that's my problem with all-inclusive is that the lower care residents are always subsidizing the higher care residents. It's not a level playing field. People are actually um, not paying for what they get or paying too much for what they get in an all-inclusive. So sort of the second part of my question to you was how do you deal with the reality that if I'm a family member and I've been a senior living consumer, right? So if I were if I were, so a couple, sort of a couple things come to mind. The first is, is that not knowing whether I'm going to get a bill for 50, you know, for, for, for $100 of extra services or um, uh, a thousand, uh, uh, you know, or $1,000 is a really tough place to be. Yeah. So, you know, I think that the, there's a, a move in the last few years towards more um, levels of care, level of care models, a, a kind of away from that a la carte, yep. where, you know, I remember that day as an executive director where, you know, end of the month, the invoices go out and I get a knock at the door. How come my bill is 300 more dollars this month than yep. it was last month? You know, and that's what you're talking about. Yep. Level of care models uh, are, are systems where, you know, do through a, some type of assessment process, you're assigned a level of care so that you can be certain that every month I'm going to be charged the same amount of money for my care and services unless my needs change. Uh, and then I'm informed. And that's, that's a more, more customer-friendly model than the a la carte that presents that nickel and diming experience um, that you described. Okay, great. So that was really my next question is, from your perspective, do you see sort of an ideal um, – uh, um, I, I, an ideal way to um, uh, to do it is it points or time or, or something else. Um, well, my uh, my preferred model is um, generally depending on, but most of the time it's a level of care model where you've got an assessment tool that is scored appropriately, linked to your service model, so that the outcome of the assessment. Uh, has a fair 
a fair and valid process to gauge the needs of the resident. Um, dollar values assigned to that scoring so you can place that outcome of that assessment into uh, a level of care model. So let's say, uh, Steve, you're my, you're my resident customer. Um, I'm your nurse. I do your, the assessment. The outcome of the assessment is 54 points. I go to my service model. Oh, that puts you at level three. Your monthly rate will be $2,300 a month until such time your needs change. Okay. Uh, you know, that is an easy model to administer. It's an easy model to manage. It's an easy model to articulate to customers. Um, it's a fair model. And, uh, and it's a, I think it's a consumer-friendly model as well. That's kind of, you know, one of, one of my more preferred models because of all those things I just mentioned. Okay, so let's just sort of walk through this. Um, if I'm an operator today, the, the key thing for me to do is to, to really start by doing a realistic assessment of what my service package, what, what I'm, how much money I'm spending on care, right? And then I'd go through a process and sort of figure out how I am allocating that by tracking the amount of, of time, uh, probably time or particular individual services that get provided to each, each resident, and then start to look at that. Is that correct? Right. You want, of course, you want to know what it's going to cost you to provide care. You want to build that and your goals into your model before you actually start offering it to customers. Find a way to assess the needs of your customers that relate to your model so that at the end of the day, um, you know what the outcome is, your customer understands that outcome and what it means to them when the invoice comes at the end of the month, that the process is linked to the other systems that are influenced by that um, so that you are generating the data you need to inform yourself how well is this going and you know that kind of good data not only helps you gauge day to day how we're doing, but it gives you the data to be able to 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 look ahead and predict and plan and budget um, to to achieve your goals. Perfect. Um, any other? I think that's all the questions I have. Any other last words for us, Mark? We're almost to the end of the hour. We're a little past forty-five minutes, so we've done well. Good. I think. I think as the final word is, you know, that this whole process takes some work, but I hope that through our discussion, we've been able to, to demonstrate that the work is worth the effort. And once you've done the homework, it pays off every day for a long time. Um, you benefit, your resident customers benefit, your workforce team members benefit. Um, yeah, it's worth it to, to do the work. Perfect. I appreciate that. And one, actually, one more question. How long does it typically take to get go through this process and to start moving in the right direction, to, to get to the point where you can actually start taking action? Wow, that's a it depends answer. It depends on the scope okay. of the project. But, you know, I would say, I mean, I can develop a service model within just a few hours after I get some numbers from the client. But then it's a matter of developing the model and then testing it. Um, to be sure that what we've developed is going to work. Um, anywhere from two to six weeks is a reasonable time. You've talked several times about testing models. What does that mean? It means that you know we do our homework, we create a model, um, and so then a, a typical testing process would be that we take the assessment tool, we do the assessment on a representative sample of residents at the, at the lower end of care, medium care, and higher end of care. We take the outcomes from that process and compare um, the new model outcomes. So in other words, you could say, what would they be paying under the new model versus what are they paying now? Mm -hmm. um, so again, kind of testing uh, the desired state outcomes against the current state and looking at the variances to inform us as to what to do next. Perfect. Well, Mark, thank you very much. I appreciate it. This I learned a ton. Um, I appreciate all of you joining us. Uh, if you have other questions, feel free to reach out to me or to Mark. Uh, we'll include Mark's email in the when we send out the links to all this. But it's 
It's mark.anderson at eldermark.com, right? It is manderson at eldermark.com. Okay, so M Anderson, all one word at eldermark.com. Yes. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody. It's great fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much.